Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Good evening, everybody. And uh, my name is Dr. Musa Akbar. I am the head of cardiology unit in Sabah Hospital. I would like to welcome all of you uh, in the Gulf Interventional Society, the master uh, intervention class. This is the series of uh, classes. This is number six, entitled the acute coronary syndrome, antiplatelet, anticoagulant, and risk factor in dyslipidemia. I uh, would like uh, to uh, welcome my co-moderator, Dr. Mohamed Belghaith, Associate Professor and Interventional Cardiologist in King Abdelaziz Medical City in Saudi Arabia and uh, ACC Governors uh, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Dr. Mohamed Belghaith, uh, welcome and joining us as a co-moderator as well as it's a pleasure also to welcome Dr. Abdul Majid Zabedi, the inter consultant interventional cardiologist and president of uh, uh, Emirates Cardiac Society from Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates is joining us. Dr. Abdul Majid, welcome. And also I would like to welcome Dr. Matthew Kasingi and Dr. Luca Tiste from uh, the uh, Policlinico San Donato Research Hospital in Milan, Italy, as a guest speaker who will join us for giving the talk today, as well as I would like also to welcome Dr. Abdullah Shab, uh, the uh, Vice President for Gulf Interventional Society, as joining us as a speaker as well. So I would like to welcome all of you and uh, we are just one month before our big meeting, the Gulf Interventional Society meeting. Uh, that will be on 18th to 20th of November. It will be on uh, in Dubai, in inter Intercontinental Vestival City in Dubai. And I would like to welcome all of you to participate physically as we will all majority of us will go and join this meeting. It's a very nice meeting. The agenda hopefully will be released uh, in about two days for the full agenda. And I would like to invite all of you to participate in this big meeting. So uh, uh, I would like also to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Uh, Matthew Kasingi, interventional cardiologist in Policlinico San Donato, Milan, Italy. I will give us a talk on the update of uh, new guidelines on antiplatelet as well as lipid lowering drugs. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Kasingi, the floor is yours to present your talk and would like to welcome you and joining us this symposium. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm honored to be here uh, sharing with you my knowledge on this field. Uh, now I'm trying to share the screen. Let me know if you are, can see the slide, please. Yeah, we are seeing the slide. Okay. Can you enlarge it, please, if you yeah. don't mind? Yeah, here we are. I'm going to give you a brief uh, talk on the updates on new guidelines and uh, therapies. Um, Can you enlarge so the yeah. story of uh, antibiotic? Go yeah. ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The story of antiplatelet therapy is a long story. It starts in uh, early 1990 uh, with the ESR trial on aspirin. Uh, then several trials on different drugs uh, which uh, inhibit antiplatelet um, uh, therapy uh, goes on, enrolling uh, thousands of patients. Uh, and more recently, uh, two uh, Ypsilon-12 uh, inhibitor were uh, <clears throat> released on the market, Prasugar and Ticagrel. All these uh, drugs were uh, evaluated both uh, acute and uh, chronic uh, coronary syndrome setting. But um, let's see which is the rationale behind giving a dual antiplatelet and an antiplatelet therapy in patient with uh, acute coronary syndrome. One of the major uh, determinants of arterial thrombosis in patient with acute coronary syndrome is a platelet addition and aggregation. Um, by giving 
drugs which inhibit uh, platelet adhesion. We are uh, somewhat inhibiting the activation of the activated by the tissue factor, tissue seven and tissue nine, uh, factor nine and factor seven that can be activated in the case of acute coronary syndrome, leading to the production of uh, um, thrombin and fibrin, and then uh, to uh, coronary thrombus. Um, for the reason, uh, several uh, pharmacological weighted in, uh, in these years. Um, First of all, uh, just to introduce this slide, here we can see uh, um, the different substrate of the um, antipodal therapy. Uh, in dark, we have the drugs that can be taken orally, and while in red, we have the two most Dr. Matteo? used um, drugs given uh, we are IP problem with the sound. We and uh, the GP2B3A inhibitor. Dr. Matteo, are you with me? Uh, but which is... Dr. Can you hear me now? Me? Yeah. There is a problem in audio. Can you uh, fix it? I, I, can, I can hear you. Okay, there is a problem in your audio via internet connection. Can you fix it? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you right now, but you closed your camera. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, now, can you hear me right? It's fine, can I go on? Okay. I, I start again. Okay. So these are the, um, the pharmacological target of the anti drugs now on the market. In uh, dark, we have the drugs that can be taken uh, orally, while in red here, we have the two drugs currently um, on the market that can be given uh, uh, EV. Um, clopidogrel, ticlopidine, prasugrel, and ticagrel, as, uh, as well as cangrel, uh, are drugs that inhibit the uh, P2, uh, PY12 receptor, while aspirin inhibits the production of uh, thrombosome and the EVGP3A inhibitors inhibits the receptor of the G2B3A. But uh, now let's see the uh, common oral drugs that are used in uh, acute coronary syndrome setting. Uh, first of all, we have um, acetyl salicylic acid, uh, common name is um, aspirin, uh, which is an active drug. It can be given uh, usually in a dose of uh, 75 to 325 daily. Then we have ticlopidine, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrel, which are uh, antagonists of the P2Y12 receptor. Um, clopidogrel and prasugrel are products. It means uh, they be activated uh, by uh, first passage in, uh, in the liver, while ticlopidine and prasugrel are active drugs. So ready uh, to, um, ticlopidine and ticagrel, sorry, are active drugs, ready to be um, submitted and uh, to inhibit platelet addition and activation. Uh, let's go to see the, um, so in depth, the different uh, anti -platelet. First of all, uh, aspirin. Uh, as I said before, uh, aspirin, inhibits COX-1 and then uh, by inhibiting COX-1, uh, he reduces the production of prostaglin A2 and, thrombo and uh, thromboxan A2. Uh, by reducing thromboxan A2, uh, the um, aspirin reduces uh, aggregation and induces uh, vasodilation. 
effect of uh, anti-plant uh, treatment with aspirin has been long studied. Uh, this is the result uh, of a um, comprehensive uh, meta-analysis uh, published on British Medical Journal in 2002, showing that uh, in each of these high-risk categories for um, acute coronary syndrome, the absolute benefit uh, of uh, giving aspirin substantially outweighed the absolute risk of a major extracranial bleeding. Concluding that aspirin should be recommended for secondary prevention in patients with cardiovascular disease. While P2Y12 antagonist uh, inhibits the P2Y12 receptor, uh, by this, the reduce the um, activation of the receptor of fibrinogen and the production of thromboxane A2. Um, and thus uh, reduce the activation of of uh, the platelet and prevents the platelet aggregation. Uh, several studies uh, evaluated the efficacy of clopidogrel for uh, secondary prevention. In this uh, large trial, enrolling 3,491 patients, the CLARITY trial, uh, presenting with ST elevation myocardial infarction, who were treated with uh, fibrinolytic therapy, aspirin, and then heparin, um, the um, dual antiplatelet therapy with clopidogrel and aspirin show a 20% risk reduction, relative risk reduction compared to aspirin plus placebo, showing that dual antiplatelet therapy is uh, of beneficial effect in ST elevation myocardial infarction uh, of patients uh, treated with fibrinolytic therapy. But um, as well, the same results were observed in the CREDO trial in patients uh, undergoing um, PCI, who were randomized to four weeks dual antiplatelet therapy, followed by aspirin alone, or uh, DAP dual antiplatelet therapy for one year, followed then for, um, uh, by aspirin alone. Uh, well, in this trial, the CREDO trial, enrolling 2,100 patients, um, they show that uh, dual antiplatelet therapy of, with clopidogrel and aspirin reduce uh, risk of uh, myocardial infarction, stroke, and death at one year. And then um, the conclusion is that the dual antiplatelet therapy um, produces a greater benefit when used up to one year compared to a dual antiplatelet therapy used only for uh, four weeks, one month. But as we know, up to 30% of people have a, a loss of function alleles on C2, C19 um, uh, that uh, impair copidogrel effectiveness. Um, in this, uh, this sort of patient, uh, they were um, at high risk of uh, a second uh, myocardial infarction uh, in case of uh, dual antibody therapy is needed. Uh, that's why several uh, two other two um, new antiplatelet uh, drugs were released on the market. First of all, the Prasuger, um, the Triton TME38 trial, enrolling 13,608 patients with high risk coronary syndrome scheduled for PCI, were randomized to clopidogrel, uh, loading dose of uh, 300 milligrams and then uh, 75 milligrams per day or Prasuger with a loading dose of 60 milligram and then 10 milligrams per day. And they were followed for a median of uh, 12 months. Well, the results of the Triton uh, TIMI 38 uh, showed that uh, um, Prasuger reduce ischemic events, but uh, we have to pay a higher rate of bleeding. Uh, um, bleeding that were uh, major team bleeding, life treating bleeding, and fatal bleeding um, in particular. And then, this is another important trial showing that the um, risk of bleeding were particularly increased in those patients in which uh, um, the uh, Praswell were um, subministrated before knowing the anatomy. Uh, in this patient, in this trial, the ACOS trial, 4,000 patients with non-ST elevation myocardial infarction uh, and a positive troponin in liver were an, uh, enrolled. And uh, this trial showed that treatment with Praswell did not reduce the rate of major ischemic events up to 30 days, 
but increase the rate of major bleeding complication. This is a very um, important trial that changed the uh, way uh, we uh, give uh, dual antibody therapy to our patient. Another potent P2 upsilon 12 uh, inhibitors that were um, released in the, um, in the market were the Ticadero. Um, in the PLATO study, uh, 18,624 patients with moderate to high risk acute coronary syndrome were randomized to clopidogrel with a loading dose of 300 to 600 milligram or Ticagrel with a loading dose of 180 milligram. Uh, the result of the PLATO study showed that Ticagrel reduced ischemic events compared to clopidogrel uh, when um, given uh, uh, in a dual anti therapy with the aspirin with uh, no higher rate of bleeding overall. That's why uh, at the beginning of the um, 2012, uh, the first uh, uh, guidelines show that uh, um, most of uh, uh, physicians prefer to uh, give to the patient Ticagro when compared to privacy. Well. But uh, recently, the result of the ESA REACT 5 trial comparing uh, with a head to head comparison Ticagro and Prasuber showed that. On 1,653 patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction who were randomized to receive Ticagrelor or Prasugrel, um, both were associated with a comparable uh, bleeding risk uh, in ST elevation myocardial infarction patients undergoing PCI. The overall efficacy of both drugs was not significantly different, but patient receiving Ticagro showed a significant increase in the risk of recurrent myocardial infarction. Seeing that, which is the rationale for selecting the drugs of, uh, uh, of our patient come to the emergency uh, department with acute coronary syndrome? Well, uh, several uh, factors should be taken in account. First of all, the patient characteristic, uh, meaning age, sex, race, history of ischemic or bleeding events. The clinical presentation, of course, patient with acute coronary syndrome compared to patient with chronic coronary syndrome had a higher uh, thrombotic burden. Comorbidities, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, uh, peripheral artery disease, and heart failure, as well as the and he uh, our platelet drugs, invasive versus conservative, PCI versus couch. Taken all together, this uh, factor uh, may influence the uh, choice of the antithrombotic treatment, the drug dosing, and the duration of the um, of the treatment itself. So let's see now uh, the current guidelines uh, for the ST elevation myocardial infarction from the 2017 ESC guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology. So uh, first of all, uh, in class 1A, a potent P2Y12 inhibitor, Prasuger or Ticagrel, should be um, given to patients uh, before PCI. Aspirin, EV or oral, is recommended as soon as possible in all patients uh, without contraindication. While um, EV, 2B3A, uh, might be considered as a bailout in case of no reflow or in, uh, in patients who are naive and do not receive P2Y12 receptor inhibitors. Um, aspirin should be given a loading dose of uh, 150 to 300 milligrams orally uh, or um, 75 to 250 uh, EV. Clobidogrel at a loading dose of 600 milligram orally. Prasugrel at a loading dose of six, uh, 60 milligram and Ticagrel at a loading dose of 180 milligram. But let's see here what is say, because actually Mm, we saw that Prasugrel uh, is uh, superior to Ticagrel in uh, patient with ST elevation myocardial infarction. 
action, but we have to be aware of body weight and uh, age. Indeed, in this patient, uh, the loading dose uh, is, a seven, uh, is a 60 milligram or orally, but we have to reduce the maintenance dose from 10 to 5 milligram day uh, because otherwise we uh, had an increased risk of, uh, um, of bleeding. So, uh, last year, the European Society of Cardiology published the new uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction guidelines. Uh, in these guidelines, the uh, societies, our European society, highlights the importance of an early invasive or immediate invasive uh, um, strategy. It means that in those patients with an established non-ST elevation myocardial infarction diagnosis, uh, an early invasive um, strategy, uh, including a um, cath uh, catheterization with the coronary angiography uh, within the first 24 hours from the um, uh, acceptance in the emergency room should be um, pursued. Uh, but why? It is important because uh, actually our guidelines did not recommend the uh, routine pretreatment uh, with a, a potent and powerful P2Y12 receptor inhibitor in non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. Indeed, in this patient, when the patient with uh, um, NST elevation, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction came to the emergency room, first of all, we should um, give to the patient unfraction heparin. Um, then, according to the bleeding risk, which is something that uh, maybe later uh, Dr. Testa will uh, show you in depth, uh, we're going to decide uh, after the coronary anatomy is known which antiplatelet give to the patient and uh, also how long should the uh, antiplatelet therapy uh, go on. The standard treatment requires a dual antiplatelet therapy uh, of aspirin plus prasugrel, ticagrel, or coplidorel for at least 12 months. In a sub -type, subset of patients uh, considered high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk, a uh, longer dual antiplatelet therapy should be given with the aspirin plus rivaroxaban or aspirin plus ticagrel, aspirin plus prasugrel, or aspirin plus clopidogrel. Another uh, regimen that can be adopted is a short dual antiplatelet therapy regimen, uh, including uh, three months of aspirin plus ticagrel, and then six, um, uh, nine months of ticagrel alone that can be continued for a long duct. Uh, in those patients at high or very high ischemic risk, we can see later again, uh, but we can choose uh, other regimen with a short or very short dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, of course, this is again to highlight the importance to give to the patient the second antiplatelet drugs only when the coronary anatomy is known. So we bring the patient to the cat lab, we perform coronary angiography, and in case we decide to um, go on with uh, percutaneous coronary artery intervention and stent implantation, we give prasugar or ticagrel or coplidogrel uh, in case prasugar or ticagrel are contraindicated to our patient. But um, which is current, the current regimen that can be adopted for long-term duct. It means the dual antiplatelet therapy beyond the first 12 months. First of all, uh, we have some risk and answer um, factor, um, like the, um, the presence of diabetes, uh, uh, recurrency of acute coronary syndrome, uh, or an acute coronary syndrome in a young age, and some technical aspect, uh, like the um, stent, uh, that, uh, stent length of implantation, uh, um, of otherwise a PCI on a bifurcation lesion with more than two stents implanted. And uh, uh, oh, we have also low bleeding risk according to the high bleeding uh, um, HBR criteria or, or a precise DAP less than 25. Which are the dual antiplatelet regimen that can be used for the extended treatments? So first of all, according to the result of the COMPASS trial, we can give 
to the um, our patient um, over aspirin, also rivaroxaban, 2.5 milligram BC in DA. Otherwise, we can add to the treatment with aspirin, clopidogrel with the 75 milligram uh, once, once a day, prasugrel, uh, 10 or 5 milligram according to body weight and age uh, once in day, or ticagrel, 60 or 90 milligram BC in DA. So this is a, a slide that uh, can uh, somewhat uh, reassume what is the take-home message for the antiplatelet therapy for non-ST elevation myocardial infarction according to these last guidelines. So before angiography, all patients should uh, be uh, given aspirin, 150, 300 milligrams, uh, oral or EV. Uh, we should give anticoagulation to our patient, in particular, infarction heparin is class 1, a from the parinux in class 1b in case we are not going to push it with the pci um, before angiography uh, routine use of uh, p2 y12 inhibitor should be avoided at the time of pci so once the coronary anatomy is known we have to give the set Second, antiplatelet drugs, uh, prasugrel that should be uh, preferred over ticagrel according to the result of the last trial I show you before, uh, or ticagrel. And in case of prasugrel and ticagrel cannot be given because of uh, contraindication, we can uh, um, sh we can add to, to uh, therapy with aspirin clopidogrel. Um, GPIs and uh, Kangler can be given uh, or in case of bailout, in case of no reflow, or if the patient uh, is naive to P2Y12 P2 inhibitor and uh, uh, must, uh, we need a potent inhibition. After PCI, standard regimen encompasses uh, dual antiplatelet therapy for 12 months. In high ischemic risk patient, we can take into consideration to extend dual antiplatelet therapy uh, for more than uh, 12 months, while in patient with um, a higher, uh, high or very high ischemic risk, we can um, uh, adopt a short or very short uh, dual antiplatelet therapy regimen. Uh, um, Dr. Tessa will discuss about this later on. But now just a few words on uh, Kangler. Uh, Kangler is a very uh, powerful uh, P2Y12 inhibitor, um, receptor antagonist um, that uh, should be given IV in uh, patient uh, naive to um, prasugrel or ticagrel before or during a PCI. Um, the kangaroo had a very, um, um, a, a very good uh, time of onset, three to six minutes, and uh, uh, a very good also time of offset, more or less of uh, 60 minutes. Uh, the metabolism of a kangaroo, uh, important, more important, is not dependent on renal or hepatic function. Uh, as we can see here on the right, um, see, while the kangaroo is, is uh, we continue the infusion of kangaroo in our patient, the platelet activity is uh, um, around zero. But as soon as we stop infusion of uh, kangaroo uh, in uh, 20 to 60 minutes, we have a, a raise of uh, platelet activity and then adhesion and um, adherence. Uh, which are the difference of Kangaroo compared to GPIs? Um, actually, is the rapid time of uh, offset of uh, Kangaroo. Uh, the fact that uh, the metabolism is independent of renal function and uh, being a uh, uh, P2Y12 receptor antagonist is a natural bridge to prasugrel or ticagrel uh, that can be given after PCI. How can we switch from Kangler or to uh, clopidogrel, prasugrel or ticagrel? It's very easy. Um, while once uh, Kangler is stopped, we have to give the oral um, 
dose of 600 milligram of clopidogrel immediately after discontinuation of cannulor. Uh, the same for prasugrel, we have to uh, give to the patient the loading dose after this, the discontinuation of cannulor, while for ticagrelor, um, being ticagrelor product, a direct inhibitor, inhibitor uh, it should be started ideally at the start of a cannulor infusion, up to immediately after this uh, discontinuation. Now I will uh, speak and I will introduce quickly the lipid uh, low index and the new guidelines of the European Society of Cardiology. But before uh, speaking about uh, lipid low in drugs, uh, uh, I need to introduce the assessment risk chart. Um, so, According to the, um, la, the um, chart we can see here on the right, we can um, differentiate our patient in low risk, moderate risk, high risk, and very high risk. But who are the patient at high risk and very high risk? So patient high risk were those patients with a markedly elevated single risk factor. Uh, patient with uh, diabetes mellitus um, uh, with uh, another risk factor or having diabetes mellitus for more than 10 years, patient with moderate chronic kidney disease and a calculated score of uh, uh, more than 5% but less than 10. While those patients uh, considered at very high risk for cardiovascular events were all patient with a um, um, uh, vascular uh, disease, including uh, prior uh, MI, acute coronary syndrome, coronary vascularization, uh, previous uh, stroke, um, transient ischemic attack, aortic aneurysm, or peripheral artery disease, or, or also sovraortic trunk disease, patient with diabetes mellitus and target omar, uh, organ damage, those patients with a severe coronary kidney disease or those patients with a calculated score over 10%. Well, um, the uh, treatment goals for LDL uh, cholesterol across these categories varies according to the last European guidelines. In particular, in those patients at high risk, um, we should pursue to have a um, LDL cholesterol less than 70 milligram, while those patients at very high uh, risk, uh, we uh, must uh, target an LDL cholesterol of less than five, uh, 55 milligram per deciliter. Um, those patients at very high risk who had a second cardiovascular event within two years, uh, we must target our LDL to cholesterol uh, less than 40. Um, this is a very nice uh, uh, scheme from the last uh, um, uh, European Society of Cardiology Guidelines um, that can help help us uh, as physicians to um, achieve the uh, target of LDL and uh, systolic blood pressure in those patients with established uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, who were considered at high risk and very high risk, sorry. So first of all, we, um, we have to uh, uh, target our LDL cholesterol uh, of less than 70 milligram per deciliter and our systolic blood pressure as less than 140. Once we achieve this uh, step one um, prevention uh, target, we have to increase and intensify the treatment, uh, trying to achieve a systolic blood pressure target of less than 130 milligrams uh, of mercury, millimeter of mercury, sorry, um, and less than 55 milligram per deciliter of LDL cholesterol. Uh, in uh, a very um, selection uh, population, we can um, add also dual antiplatelet therapy or novel upcoming interventions such as uh, colchicine in order to reduce the inflammatory burden and the total cardiovascular risk. But which are the drugs uh, uh, that can be used uh, nowadays uh, 
to uh, achieve this uh, target that is actually very low of less than 55 milligram per deciliter of uh, um, LDL cholesterol in patient having an established uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So we have um, five uh, drugs uh, which can we uh, see here in red uh, the ben Bempedoic acid, um, the statins, which inhibit the uh, HMZ-CoA, the oral B acid sequestrant, the ezetimib, and the new PCA scanai inhibitors, alirocumab and evolocumab. But which is the indication uh, for these drugs uh, according to the various setting? So, uh, first of all, uh, as I said before, uh, in patients with established uh, um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, lipid lowering treatment with an ultimate goal of uh, more than 50% reduction, uh, at least uh, uh, with a target of at least less than uh, 55 milligram per deciliter, is, is uh, recommended. Uh, in case um, the goals and the target, this target of 55 milligram per deciliter is not achieved with a maximum tolerated dose of statin, combination with ezetimib uh, plus uh, high dose statin is recommended. Uh, for primary prevention, in those patients not achieving this target, but considered at very high risk, combination therapy of uh, statin, ezetimib, and PCA scanai inhibitor may be considered. So the class of recommendation in this case is 2B level of evidence C. For the secondary prevention um, of patients who are not achieving their goals, so we are, we are speaking about patients who had already uh, cardiovascular events and are not yet on their target of less than 55 milligram per deciliter of uh, LDL cholesterol, uh, despite a maximum tolerated dose of statin and ezetimib, Combination therapy, including a PCA SK9 inhibitors, is recommended. Uh, in this case, so uh, in patients uh, uh, having a secondary prevention, the level of evidence is uh, much higher. So with class one level A, as well as for patients at a very high risk uh, with uh, mm, familial hypercholesterolemia um, who do not achieve their goals, uh, also in this is uh, um, a combination therapy, including PCA SK9 inhibitor, is uh, recommended. Uh, from um, last um, registries uh, and in the last European guidelines, it has been introduced also the possibility um, that uh, if a statin-based regime is not tolerated at any dosage, ezetimib should be considered. But uh, we have also to take in mind that in this uh, specific uh, patient, so for secondary prevention or very high risk uh, patient in primary, primary prevention, who do not tolerate statins, um, PCA SK9 inhibitors can be started uh, as a first line uh, therapy. Um, but again, the level of evidence uh, is uh, low in class 2BC. Uh, for the treatment of um, hypertriglyceridemia, uh, of course, uh, uh, statin is uh, recommended. In case of uh, um, very high level of uh, uh, hypertriglyceridemia and patients were considered high risk. Um, uh, uh, N3 PUFA uh, like Ecosap and Etil can be uh, added to uh, current uh, statin treatment uh, with the goal of less than 200 uh, milligram per deciliter of uh, triglycerides. Uh, here is a scan um, in which we can show the hypothetical LDL cholesterol values uh, with different intensity of lipid lowering therapies uh, and combination. Um, high intensity uh, statin usually uh, bring us to a reduction of uh, 50%, but in case we need a higher 
um, percentage of uh, reduction for very high level of LDL cholesterol, we should uh, uh, start adding ezetimib in case of uh, um, very, very high risk or in case the patient uh, is not on his uh, uh, target, uh, we add PCASK9 inhibitor that can be, um, can be given to the patient in combination with statins uh, at uh, various intensity or statins plus uh, ezetimib. Uh, the role of uh, PCA-SK9 inhibitors is uh, well known, uh, but just to reminder that uh, um, over the reduction of LDL cholesterols, uh, uh, both alirocumab and ebolocumab, that are the two PCA-SK9 inhibitors currently on the market, reduce also um, triglycerides level by 26%. Um, these uh, are... Um, antibodies that can be um, currently given by a, a subcutaneous uh, uh, injection uh, once or twice uh, months. Thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Matteo Casingi from Italy for the two topic uh, presentation, acute coronary syndrome antiplatelets and its role and the lipid lowering drugs. Uh, I'm sure there will be a uh, questions uh, related to your topic, so I kindly ask you to stay with us till the end of symposium. And please, for all participants, kindly type your question in the QA box. We'll have a time for a QA uh, question and discussion at the end of the presentation. Now I will leave the floor for Dr. Abdul Majid Zubaydi for to introduce uh, our next speaker. Thanks, Dr. Musa uh, Akbar, for uh, uh, yeah, for your introduction. And uh, uh, next uh, talks we have is uh, Professor Luca uh, Testa. Uh, he is a cardiologist, intervention cardiologist from uh, uh, Policlinico San Donato in uh, Milan. And uh, uh, Dr. Testa got two talks for us. Uh, uh, tonight, the uh, first talk is high bleeding risk and uh, triple therapy. And then the second talk is going to be on antiplatelets, anticoagulants therapies for structural heart disease. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Testa, I think you can go ahead with the. Well, talks. thank you very much for this introduction, but perhaps for this kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to share with colleagues this kind of activities. And of course, this is. Very important, uh, you know, very important topic. And of course, we we face this topic every day, every single day. But anyway, just first of all, please confirm that you see what I see. I mean, I go in presentation mode. Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. We okay, do. That's, great. that's great. Okay, so high blood risk and triple therapy. I mean, this is something that we all, you know, we all discuss every day because, I mean, in particular, because of the aging of the population, there is a, the need for oral anticoagulants, but also dual antibiotic therapy because of some kind of intervention for coronaries or even other districts of our body is becoming even more, even more frequent. And, and uh, this is just, uh, you know, a way to, to make a synthetic picture. I mean, every day, I mean, we need to guarantee the balance between the bleeding risk and the ischemic risk. So there is a daily conundrum. So every day we discuss about a possibility of balancing the drugs that we give to protect against ischemic risks, but also the side effect of these drugs, meaning that we can give the risk of bleeding. Let's start from the definition. Of course, all these definitions are taken from the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. So what does high bleeding risk HBR means at the time of PCI? HBR is defined as BARC three or five bleeding risk of at least 4% at one year or a risk of intracranial hemorrhage of at least 1% at one year. This is at the time of PCI. But if we go on with this definition, there are some major criteria and some minor criteria, of course, I'm not going to read the full list that is coming in the next slide, but we need to consider patients at high bleeding risk if at least one major or two minor criteria are met. This 
slide is just to summarize. Of course, in the left side, you will see the list of major and minor uh, bleeding risk according to European Society of Cardiology guidelines. As you can see on the right side, there are a lot of different aspects, including obviously the aging, including the comorbidities, the laboratory tests, but also the bleeding history, the problem that has been maybe possibly experienced by the patient at the level of neurological system, but also the iatrogenic problems. And as you can see from the arrow on the top left, there is always, always the need to consider the possibility of long-term oral anticoagulation. And this is the ischemic risk. The ischemic risk is actually endorsed in this guideline some features. What are these features? Well, first, first of all, these features are very, very common as you can see, but they, they are actually shared by the bleeding risk as well. In particular, if you look at the risk and answers, for example, you can see that there is diabetes mellitus, history of regular MI, polyvascular disease, but also the premature accelerated coronary artery disease. There are also some technical aspects in particular or related to the procedure that we're about to do for the coronary arteries, but also some other moderate thrombotic risk, meaning that they are in class 2B. Again, diabetes, regarding MI, polyvascular disease, and impaired renal function. And this terrible table is just to show you what has been done so far by the literature. That, of course, the, the story, uh, well, it's a long story because it started more than 20 years ago with the worst trial. And then we've seen the ISAR triple and then Pioneer AF, Ridual PCI, Gustos, and, and Trust. Of course, the very first two trials have been performed using the VK antagonism. But of course, as you can see, at the other trials, the Pioneer has been done testing the Rivaroxaban, the Ridual PCI testing the Dabigatron, the Augustus, the Pixaban, and the Entrust, the Edoxaban. Of course, I'm not going to go through all the details and the primary and secondary endpoints. However, what is or needed to know is that all these trials have been designed almost at the same time with different population, with slightly different design, a slightly different primary as well as secondary endpoints. Nevertheless, if you took all together this, this, the evidence coming from this trial, you, we can conclude that well therapy is associated with an absolute reduction in major bleeding events of 2% compared to an ab absolute risk of stent thrombosis of 0.4% without an effect of overall maze. So in other words, we can conclude that there is clearly, clearly if in, an advantage of the dual well, anti antithrombotic therapy as compared to all the data that we have seen from these trials. And as such, yes, guidelines are some indications concerning this kind of real data. First of all, for a formal risk score based assessment of bleeding risk, the ASBLED is strongly encouraged in class 2A. But also in class 1, the, there is a need for stroke and bleeding risk reassessment at periodic intervals. The meaning of this is that, of course, the, the clinical condition, the age, and some other factors may change over time in this patient. So we need to reassess periodically our, our patient. And last but not least, in patients with atrial fibrillation initiated low risk of stroke, the first reassessment of stroke risk should be made four to six months after the index evaluation. And this is actually the same concept as before. The condition, the clinical condition may change. So the ESC guidelines, they suggest to reassess after an initial assessment judging the patient at low risk after four or six months. What is the ASBLED? We all know the ASBLED because it's there since a long time, but it's just to refresh our mind. As you can see, there are some, uh, some features in particular, I would like to draw your attention about the, the S because it's concerning the stroke risk. I mean, meaning that if the patient has had a previous ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, there is one point awarded, but also the label INR, the elderly age, age more than 65, and then a drug and abnormal renal function and control hypertension, of course. But of course, we need to look at these risk factors for bleeding with oral anticoagulant therapy and antiplatelet therapy because the, the European guidelines are trying to summarize all the knowledge concerning this kind of drugs. 
and in particular, they decided to actually or create four different groups, meaning that we have non-modifiable, potentially modifiable, modifiable, and the biomarkers or risk factors. So in other words, our patients should be evaluated according to all but the presence of all these risk factors. Of course, for the sake of time, I cannot read everything, but what is absolutely important is the risk score for patient stratification. And in particular, there is a suggestion concerning patients with possible in indication to triple antibiotic therapy. We need to estimate the bleeding risk and the use of scores may be considered in particular in patients undergoing coronary angiography. As you can see, there is not much evidence. In particular, there is a class 2B indication and level of evidence B. However, for example, the C guidelines suggest to use the IRC for high bleeding risk score at the time of precutaneous coronary intervention. And again, I would like to draw your attention on some oh, specific markers. In particular, see on the right side that there's minor criteria, again, the age or over 75, the renal failure, the spontaneous bleeding in a, in a hist clinical history, and, and any ischemic stroke. But also on the left side, the major criteria, I would like to, to draw your attention over the severe or end-stage chronic kidney disease, again and again, anticipated use of long-term or antiviral therapy, number one and number two in that list. So, what about the recommendation again? Stroke prevention is recommended to atrial fibrillation with at least one non-sex Schatz vas stroke risk factors. For patients with at least two non-sex stroke risk factors, oral antiguolent is recommended. And these are the indication for antiplatelet. In patients with atrial fibrillation, dual antiviral therapy is recommended as a default strategy using a NOAC at the recommended dose for stroke prevention and a single oral antiplatelet agent. Periprocedural dual antiplatelet therapy consisting of aspirin and clopidogrel is recommended for one week. And this is a major change according to what we used to do in the recent years. The discontinuation of antiplatelet treatment in patients treated with oral antiplatelet coagulation is recommended after 12 months. And this scheme is actually what the current European Society of Cardiology Guidelines state. As you can see, that regardless the level of bleeding risk from default to high and high ischemic risk, there is always some, the same suggestion for the very first week after the event. And these guidelines are related to the non-ST non elevation acute coronary syndromes because I need to remember that the guidelines concerning the coronary vascularization have not been updated yet. So what we can refer to is just the use of, let's say, the, these guidelines for acute coronary syndromes and on ST elevation myocardial infarction. Well, by the way, even the myocardial infarction guidelines have not yet been updated. So this is the most recent one. Again, one week of triple therapy, oral anticoagulant plus dual antibiotic therapy, meaning aspirin and a P2YE12 receptor. Inhibitor. But in the case of triple therapy, as I said before, the clopidogrel is the second antiviral therapy of choice. And then the default strategy, and it is green because it's class 1A, is a dual double therapy with a NOAC and a single antiviral therapy. Again, it should be clopidogrel for the rest of the year, so up to 12 months, and then the oral antiviral alone. For hybrid risk, after one week, there is, oh, there is a suggestion to switch to double therapy for six months and then to um, adjust the oral anticoagulation after six months and then NOAC after 12. So if you look at the high ischemic risk, the, 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 there is a, well, I would say a large difference, in particular because the triple therapy is a suggested up to one month and then it should be followed by the double therapy. So these are the take home message for this first part of my presentations. So the, there is always a conundrum. The ischemic risk must be balanced against the bleeding risk. And to do that, we need to take into account the patient characteristics as well as the clinical presentation, of course, because a patient coming to our attention because of resting angina of myocardial infarctions is actually a totally different uh, scenario as compared to a stable patient. 
we need to consider comorbidities, in particular diabetes, renal failure, and peripheral arterial disease, but also the heart failure. We need to consider the co-medication, in particular the need for oral anticoagulation treatment. And lastly, we need to consider the procedural aspects, PCI or cabbage, femoral versus radial access, and other, let's say, very technical aspects. So, the ability to risk patients undergoing PCI represent a daily challenge. Using risk scores may be helpful in order to define therapeutic strategy. A default strategy after PCI with a minimum of one week of triple and triple and triple antigoagulant antiplatelet therapy followed by, followed by dual is recommended. Clopidogrel is the antiplatelet of choice in the context of triple therapy, or actually uh, well, together with the aspirin. No, novel or anticoagulant over or BK antagonists are recommended. And we need to reconsider the modified risk factors for bleeding because this is very helpful, in particular because these patients are a, well, actually a moving target. So thank you for your attention for this very first part. So if you agree, I will go straight yeah, to the second presentation. Do you agree? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, I'll do. All right. Just give me a second. I will try to share. Okay, this one. Okay, please, again, confirm that you see my presentation. Yeah, we do see it. Okay, good. So, Oh, this, oh, this, well, this presentation, the second presentation of mine is actually strongly related to the first one. And um, I would like to go straight to the point. As you all know, the interventions for valvular and structural diseases are rapidly expanding worldwide. And currently, the percutaneous approach represents the standard of care. These procedures are burdened by a significant risk of embolic complications, such as stroke and myocardial infarction. Thus, the antibody therapy represents a cornerstone or a junkie pharmacology therapy, although type and doses of depletor agents remain mostly empiric, and this concept will come back several times. Patients with structural diseases undergoing percutaneous procedures are predisposed, however, to hybrid risk because of specific procedural issues, such as vascular access from larger devices, but also their comorbidities and frailty. Let's start from the, let's say, the hot topic for, for this presentation, the TABI. If you look at this, at this slide on the right side, you see that they, these are the recommendation, the very last recommendation coming from the European Society of Cardiology, European Association of Cardiac Thoracic Surgeon. So if you look at, the, uh, at what is the recommendation, the TABI should be considered, should be performed in patients over 75 years old or and suitable at high risk for sever and suitable for transfemoral TAVI. So in other words, there are oh, some specific specific features we should consider before, before actually you know, directing our strategy to the TAVR. But we also need to consider that the pharmacology is directed to the, the reduction, as I said, of the ischemic risk, in particular, the cerebrovascular events and TAVI. And we need also to consider and remember that strokes remain a troublesome adverse effect of following TAVI. And in the Parton trial, strokes occur more frequently among patients when they go TAVI than among patients who receive standard therapy, as you can see from the slide. There is a clear, a clear excess of stroke in patients treated by means of TAVI. But also we need to consider what is the impact of cerebrovascular events and cardiovascular, well, cerebrovascular events worsen the prognosis of patients that go in TAVR. And in this publication done a few years ago, major stroke within 30 days after the TAVR has been demonstrated to be an independent predictor of mortality or long-term follow-up. What are the basis of pharmacological prevention of stroke? Well, according to this publication, recent publication two years ago, there are basically two hypotheses. First one is, well, the antiplatelet hypothesis, meaning that thrombi may develop in conditions of high stress and are rich in platelets. In these circumstances, the antiplatelet therapy outperforms anticoagulant therapy. On the other end, according to the antithrombin hypothesis, the thrombi develop in conditions of low shear stress and are rich in fibrin. 
In these circumstances, anticoagulant therapy outperforms antiplatelet therapy. But also, we need to consider, as I said before, the bleeding risk of a TAVI. The bleeding risk remained another important matter to be considered in frail and vulnerable patients, as those with severe artery stenosis and a high vertebral risk. This is evidence coming from well, a relatively old paper manuscript in 2012 on Journal of Medical College of Cardiology. There is actually an incidence of life threatening and major bleeding after TAVI of around 15% to 22% in a with meta analysis of 16 studies. But if you look at the Parton trial, major bleedings within 30 days were strongly and independently associated with one-year mortality in the overall population, both in patients undergoing TAVI than those surgically treated. So if you look at these two, or these two figures, you see that in the, with the suburb population, as well as in the tablet population, the presence of a major bleeding is strongly correlated with a higher risk of death. So what we know from the 2021 guidelines for management of viral heart disease, as I said, is actually relatively simple because the indication is class one for oral, oral, anticoagulant, uh, oral anticoagulant in the absence of other indication of of uh, anticoagulation, we should consider the SEPT. But if there is an in indication to oral anticoagulation, for example, either fibrillation, the oral anticoagulant therapy alone must be considered. It is as class one other way. Let's see, first of all, where this indication coming from. But well, this is very first trial we should consider. This is the ART trial. This is a randomized 100 11 or surgical treatment and uh, well, sorry, or single antiplatelet therapy versus dual antiplatelet therapy after having XT3, so the older generation. The trial has been stopped prematurely and enrolled only 74% of the 100 plain patients because the composite of my stroke, TIA, or major life threatening bleeding tended to be higher in the dual antiplatelet group. That's very important piece of information. But we need also to talk about the popular TABI. The popular TABI, as you can see, is actually split in two cohorts, the cohort A and the cohort B. In the cohort B, A, sorry, the two primary outcomes were old bleeding and non procedural bleeding over a period of 12 months. The two secondary outcomes were a composite death from cardiovascular causes, non procedural related bleeding, stroke, or myocardial infarction, secondary composite one. A composite of death death from cardiovascular causes, ischemic stroke, or myocardial infarction at one year. So let's go back to the comparison of single versus dual. This is the cohort A, as I said, over the popular tablet. Among patients undergoing TABI who did not have an indication for oral anticoagulation, again, do not have an indication, the incidence of bleeding and the composite of bleeding or thrombobolic events at one year were significantly less frequent with aspirin than with aspirin plus clopidogrel administered for three months. So in other words, this seems to be an advantage of aspirin alone. And then let's, let's have a look at this. Novel, novel anticoagulant therapy and TAVI. This is the Galileo. The Galileo actually enrolled a large number of patients, more 1,500 of patients with some key exclusion criteria. I would like to mention in particular the ongoing indication of dual antibiotic therapy or anticoagulation. So these patients had no indication for oral anticoagulation or nor dual antibiotic therapy. This has been randomized one to one to dual antibiotic therapy for three months or rivaroxaban and then rivaroxaban versus aspirin. Well, the Galileo trial of rivaroxaban after TAVR has been stopped early for harm. Rivaroxaban treated patients at increased risk of all cause mortality, thrombobolic events, and bleeding versus those on antibiotic therapy. So, in patients without indication of, to oral anticoagulation, this trial actually showed uh, the inferiority of rivaroxaban has been stopped. We need also to consider in how many patients atrial fibrillation um, is actually a matter of fact, in particular in the, in the field of TABR. As you can see from this slide, uh, the percentage of patients with, uh, with atrial fibrillation is absolutely different uh, compared to the population, ethnicity, and so forth. But as you can see, it actually ranges from 16, 20% to 40, 47%. So we need to consider this trial. 
This trial actually concerned warfarin after TAVR for AFib patients. The, in this post time immunotherapy with VK antagonist versus VK antagonist plus any antiplatelet therapy in a multicenter evaluation of more than 600 patients with atrial fibrillation. So the results of three months were no difference in stroke rate, mace, or death, but a higher risk of bleeding for the multi therapy. So the higher bleeding risk for VK antagonist plus until any antibiotic therapy over VKA. And this is actually what we what we said and just said. There is a large difference in terms of bleeding risk, but there is no difference in terms of stroke, MI, or cardiovascular death. So the combination therapy loses again. So the clopidogrel girl reduces the bleeding over aspirin when in association with VKA. This is just a sub-analysis. In particular, as you can see, the two groups are largely different in terms of size, but this is just a hypothesis generating. Apparently, when the combination is indicated, clopidogrel is better than aspirin. But again, this is just hypothesis generating. Let's have a look at the core B of the popular tablet. Okay, you see, these are patients with indication to oral anticoagulant. And in the court B, the clopidogrel, in addition to oral anticoagulants, was associated with a higher incidence of bleeding and no decrease in the incidence of ischemic events than anticoagulation alone. So again, when there is indication to oral anticoagulation, any combination therapy seems to be you know, less effective. Let's have a look at the Atlantis. The Atlantis has been presented at the last TCT and uh, is still not published. But if you look at this, we, this trial concerned 1,500 patients after successful TAVI procedure and it's been divided into two stratum. One with indication for all anticoagulant therapy and the other one without indication. And then these two stratum have been randomized to VKA versus apixaban five milligram or dual antiparatelial therapy, single divided therapy versus apixaban. And these are, as you can see, only this is the slide presented at GCT, and there's no difference. There's no difference at the primary endpoint where in the group of oral anticoagulation. There's no difference in the primary endpoint in the group of without oral anticoagulation. And there is actually, this is a negative trial. But summarizing, there was no be between groups difference in the incidence of composite primary endpoint. But these findings were confirmed in subgroup analysis of patients with an established indication to oral anticoagulant or without an established indication to oral anticoagulant. Although the Pixaban failed to demonstrate a clear benefit, there were no safety concerns. This is very important. But this makes both strategies plausible and potential alternative options. This is actually one of the conclusions of the authors where they say, that, okay, the apixaban didn't reach superiority. However, there is no safety concern. So it can be used. However, this is obviously not a conclusive word. Some, something that has been actually conclusive, however, has been published recently. This is the Envisage Tavi AF trial. So the, oh, these patients were randomized after Taver without severe complications at randomization to edoxaban 60 milligrams daily with or without antiplatelet therapy versus VKA with or without antiplatelet therapy. Of course, the edoxaban has been subject to adjustment, those adjustments. So the primary efficacy outcome was a composite of those events consisting of death for many causes, myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, systemic thromboembolism, valve and thrombosis, or major bleeding. The primary safety outcome was major bleeding. The doxaban was non-inferior to vitamin K antagonists for a composite primary outcome of adverse clinical events. The incidence of major bleeding was higher with the doxaban than with the vitamin K antagonists. The difference was mostly attributed to more gastrointestinal bleeds with the doxaban, including one that was fatal. And now it's time to switch because we just you know, concluded the, this overview about the tavern which was actually you know, long, oh, long time taking, but for the, trend, for the metal valve, as you will see, the situation is much more simpler, I would say. The severe matter regurgitation is fairly common in the general population is associated with significant morbidity and mortality. Although the surgical mitral valve repair and placement are well-established treatment options, 
as much as one half of patients with severe symptomatic MR are not referred for surgery to do prohibitive procedural risk. Novel transcale alternatives are therefore being developed to provide an alternative treatment for these patients. The, well, we need to, first of all, state something that is relatively simple. There is a lack of data on the management of antithrombotic therapy after transcatheter mitral valve replacement. There are some initial seminal uh, data uh, mostly related to case reports and very, very small cohorts. But however, this is the situation. The oral anticoagulant using a BK antagonist should be considered for the first three months, class 2A level of evidence B. Oral anticoagulation is recommended lifelong for patients who have other indications for anticoagulation, which is obvious. But anyway, as you, as I said before, there is no much evidence to talk about. We also, but we need to consider what is the possible source of the thrombotic risk, at least. Well, there are some procedure-related factors, some transcard heart valve specific feature, and some patient-related factors, including, of course, atrial fibrillation and prior thromboembolic events, LB dysfunction. So according to available early evidence, the thrombotic risk seems to be relevant after transcatheter mitral valve replacement, but there are multiple mechanisms implicated in this, in this procedure. So if you look at this registry, in the outcomes of transcatheter mitral valve replacement for degenerative bryoprosthesis, failed anoplasty rings, and mitral anal calcification, okay, you can immediately understand that these are different subjects, different scenarios. However, the paucity of this of this patients actually has forced the authors to collect all together in order to achieve a decent number and to draw or reasonable conclusions. Well, this TMVR registry is an international multicenter observational study that enrolled consecutive patients undergoing undergoing transmitter trans mitral valve replacement for degenerative bioprosthesis, failed anoplasty, or severe mitral anal calcification by MAC at high risk for conventional mitral valve surgery, of course. So the anticoagulation thrombophylaxis seems to be beneficial after transcatheter mitral valve replacement procedure in line with current clinical practice after surgical bioprosthetic mitral valve replacement. So no news, I would say, because it seems like the use of anticoagulation is associated with a lower risk of cumulative rate of thrombosis. So what to do? Well, this actually, or something that we need to consider, oh, sorry. So the guidelines for the management of barbara heart disease suggest the use of this transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair if anatomically suitable. So the, for the repair, we need to, well, to look at the guidelines coming from the surgical experience, but for the transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge replacement, this is a really a brand new situation. This is the level of indication coming from the guidelines. And of course, if we look at the Everest 1, Everest 2, but also the Everest 2 high risk registry, a regimen of com composed of aspirin and three months of clobidogrel is the most commonly used. And of course, is absolutely empirical. So the, these regimens have not been evaluated in controlled randomized trials. Moreover, thrombotic complications are rare, while bleeding events seems to be more frequent. Thus, it could be hypothesized that a single antiplatelet anticoagulant agent may be enough postoperatively. These findings underline the need of further research to evaluate the impact of other peri post procedural strategy. And these are my conclusions. The amount of evidence, as I said, is directly related to the magnitude of procedures done, in particular, TAVR and then transcatheter edge to edge repair and lastly transcatheter mother bar replacement where there is no evidence at all but we need to refer to the surgical experience overall the evidence in the field of mother valve are scarce future probably design trials should investigate further thanks for your attention thank you Dr. so uh dr musa are we uh we get questions or we'll get it after no, that. Let's let's move uh, yeah. let's move uh, to one next more. Yeah. one move uh, because of the time and then we will uh, have also our friend Dr. Abdullah will give then we'll have uh, 25 minutes for discussion. I already prepared some questions until waiting the partici participant to type their question in QA box. So let's move to the next please. Uh, uh, Ahmed uh, will yes. introduce. Yeah. 
uh, I think we will go back to our first speaker, Victor uh, Matteo Kosinghi from Italy, Milan, and he will talk to us and share some of his experience, cases, and complications. Victor Matteo. Yeah, um, good evening again. Can you hear me? Yes. So I'm going to share the screen. OK, coming. Yeah. Let me know if you can see the yeah. slides. That's okay. perfect. Great. So uh, good evening again. Uh, I'm going to introduce you some case uh, uh, that uh, hopefully can uh, just add some uh, discussion to our presentation. Uh, the first case I would like to introduce you uh, is a um, clinical uh, case of a male, uh, 56 years old, uh, who suffered of uh, arterial hypertension, uh, insulin-dependent uh, diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, and uh, obesity. Uh, the patient um, underwent on March 2021 uh, to a coronary CT scan due to his uh, very high cardiovascular risk profile. And the coronary CT scan showed a moderate left main stenosis, uh, significant uh, mid uh, LAD and obtuse marginal stenosis, and a moderate stenosis of the first diagonal branch. Uh, the same month, uh, the patient underwent a um, transthoracic uh, echocardiography showing a preserved uh, ejection fraction of 69% uh, with a uh, very good left ventricular function, no valvular heart disease, and uh, uh, um, uh, suvaortic trunk uh, ultrasound showing a, a significant significant, uh, um, no, non-significant stenosis of both right and left uh, internal carotid artery. Um, given this, uh, this picture, the patient was referred to our center for uh, coronary angiography. And the uh, coronary angiography actually confirmed the findings of the coronary CT scan showing a diffusely diseased and calcific left anterior descending uh, with a significant stenosis of 90% uh, in the mid part um, and uh, also a, a diseased left main, uh, also partially calcific. Um, here we can see uh, from the caudal view the significant stenosis uh, uh, of the obtuse marginal uh, involving also the bifurcation of the obtuse marginal branch with the circumflex. Uh, and also in this uh, caudal view, we can appreciate uh, the diffused uh, and diseased uh, left main. Um, here is the RCA uh, confirming the presence also in uh, this site, uh, in this side of the heart of a significant uh, uh, stenosis uh, of this uh, non-dominant uh, right coronary artery. Based on current evidence and uh, guidelines, uh, um, we know that this is a three vessel uh, coronary heart disease uh, patient uh, with diabetes mellitus and with an involvement of left main. So, uh, actually, in uh, most uh, cases, these are um, surgical patients who uh, should be referred to the surgeon for a coronary heart bypass graft. In our case, the patient refused cardiac surgery, uh, so was listed uh, for um, percutaneous coronary artery intervention. Um, first of all, we perform um, PCI of a circumflex uh, obtuse marginal with a kissing balloon reopening the uh, struts uh, from the uh, C, uh, circumflex obtuse marginal to the native uh, six uh, with a very good uh, final result. Uh, then we uh, go on uh, treating the uh, left main. Uh, as we can see here, uh, and can be appreciated uh, with an uh, injection with uh, um, this uh, uh, guiding catheter, uh, the long calcific diffuse disease requiring uh, um, uh, rotational atherectomy with the uh, rotablator, and then also cutting balloon. So the so-called rota cut, mm, we put in this case uh, a lot of uh, effort uh, and uh, a lot of the um, 
instruments we have in the cat lab in order to achieve the best possible result. Uh, after the so-called rotacat, we proceed with the implantation of stents, uh, but suddenly we have a left main dissection. We can see and we can appreciate here. Uh, obviously, this left main dissection is due to uh, the guiding catheter maybe uh, dipping into the left main proximal LAD uh, while working on LAD. Uh, in order to fix this, uh, this section, uh, uh, another death uh, synergy megatron was uh, uh, then placed to, uh, into the left main, and then a final kissing balloon was performed. The final result uh, was actually very, very good, showing a Timmy Flow uh, 3 uh, and the selection of the all the. Um, the stenosis. But uh, now, uh, this is the first question to the audience. What about uh, dual antiplatelet uh, therapy in this patient? Um, current uh, guidelines on uh, chronic coronary syndrome suggest uh, a um, six months dual antiplatelet therapy uh, that can be prolonged up to 12 or uh, longer in case of uh, high ischemic risk and low bleeding risk. But how can we evaluate uh, uh, ischemic and uh, um, bleeding uh, risk? As Dr. Tessa said before, uh, um, two uh, um, score has been developed and evaluated uh, for uh, the uh, decision on the long-term versus short-term DAPT. One of these uh, can be used at time of uh, the PCI and is the precise DAPT score. Uh, this score uh, encompasses the level of uh, uh, hemoglobin, um, white blood cell, age, um, renal function, prior bleeding, and gives us a score from po the, the points from 0 to 100. In case of a score less than 25, uh, we can go on with standard or long DAPT because the risk of bleeding is very low. In case of a score or um, over equal over to 25, we have to under, undergo for a, a short a dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, but um, over the bleeding risk, we have also to evaluate uh, the thrombotic risk. And um, last guidelines on uh, uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction and chronic coronary syndrome gives us some um, tips to uh, recognize those patients uh, considered at high thrombotic risk. These are risk and answer uh, factor and technical aspect factor. Um, in our case, this patient uh, is a patient with uh, diabetes mellitus requiring uh, insulin with a multivessel uh, CAD and also uh, um, peripheral artery disease um, plus uh, the uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, remember that the patient has a positive ultrasound. Moreover, uh, the patient had uh, more than three stents implanted with more than three lesions treated with a total stent length of more than 60 millimeters. And also uh, this patient underwent a complex revascularization with a um, bifurcation strategy and uh, left, uh, left main PCI. Um, all these things considered, we can uh, evaluate the thrombotic and the bleeding risk. And this patient is a patient uh, ca that can be considered high thrombotic risk and uh, very low bleeding risk. Um, in this case, long-term DAPT could be taken into account. Um, but which uh, is the uh, best um, uh, antiplatelet agent that can be used? Um, Current guidelines suggest that uh, all the um, P2 Ypsilon 12 inhibitors can be uh, adopted for long-term DAPT. 
And also, uh, rivaroxaban at the dosage of 2.5 milligrams BC in DA can be um, administered to, uh, to, this, uh, um, to this patient. In our case, uh, we choose, uh, um, given the high ischemic risk, uh, but the very good result with uh, uh, all the three vessels that were fixed, a uh, dual uh, antiplatelet therapy, long term dual antiplatelet therapy with uh, cardio aspirin uh, and uh, clopid. 25 milligrams uh, once uh, once a day. Thank you for your attention. Now I can maybe I can go on with uh, um, another um, yes, presentation. Yes, yes, go ahead. So this is a patient uh, who um, came to our attention. Um, uh, referred to an hour, another center. This was a uh, 73 years old woman, woman uh, who suffered from hypertension and non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus uh, with a history of uh, exceptional dyspnea. This patient underwent a treadmill test, uh, was uh, showing uncertain result, uh, an echocardiogram showing preserved systolic function without uh, significant regional dyskinesia and a preserved ejection fraction of uh, 55% mild mitral regurgitation. And then uh, she underwent uh, CT coronary scan uh, showing a severely calcified left main disease with a significant stenosis on proximal and mid left anterior descending artery. Uh, the patient underwent uh, coronary angiography uh, into another center uh, showing actually a moderate left main stenosis uh, with a critical proximal left anterior descending. We can see here on the on the right um, involving also first and second diagonal branches uh, and also significant um, lesion on the obtus marginal branch so this is a patient with uh, um, complex but not so complex uh, anatomy with a syntax score of 24 uh, diabetic uh, and mm, in this patient in another center uh, was referred to other to our cardiac surgeon for um, uh, uh, um, CABG, uh, coronary artery bypass graft revascularization. Uh, the patient underwent so uh, um, implantation of a, a left internal mammary artery on LAD and a saphenous brain graft on the optus uh, marginal. Uh, this is the, um, the EKG, um, which is uh, nearly normal, uh, that uh, has been made as soon as the patient came out from the OR. But suddenly, during night, we have this uh, uh, tombstone ST elevation uh, uh, in the anterior uh, uh, with a, uh, also involving uh, posterior leads. Um, the patient was placed into uh, intraortic balloon pump bedside and then referred to our um, unit for a urgent uh, coronary angiography. Coronary angiography showing a normal right coronary artery, uh, like was at the, the beginning, and uh, um, the significant stenosis here we can see on the optus marginal, and the significant stenosis uh, on the um, left anterior descending. Uh, we can appreciate here that there wasn't a very good competitive flow from left uh, uh, internal mammary artery. Um, this is, was the um, angiography of the vein graft that was uh, completely occluded. And we can see here uh, the left internal mammary artery that uh, was uh, uh, not um, at all um, perfusing the uh, left anterior descending. So this is a patient uh, uh, in uh, which uh, uh, we had a very recent, just a few hours before, um, sternotomy. Uh, that should be considered at uh, very high risk. Uh, but with a ST elevation myocardial infarction, uh, so we have to undergo to PCI, but before undergoing PCI, we have to carefully evaluate the bleeding and thrombotic risk. 
uh, we have several um, factors that can be uh, um, evaluated uh, for uh, the bleeding risk. Uh, we have the precise depth, the as bled, the ACC cut PCI bleeding risk and the crusade score. Uh, all these uh, bleeding risk, uh, despite being out of hospital or in hospital bleeding risk, show us that this patient was uh, to should be considered uh, at a high, very high bleeding risk, uh, but was also a P2 Y12 knife patient. So what we should do in this uh, in this case uh, we we are going to treat with uh, percutaneous coronary intervention and stent implantation a very high uh, risk uh, patient uh, that uh, is going to require a long um, stent uh, implantation of several millimeters. So DAPT is really needed. And over IV, because the patient was still uh, in uh, oral, uh, oral intubated, uh, or over IV acetyl salicylic acid, we have to consider an alternative uh, um, uh, regimen to uh, avoid um, acute uh, stent thrombosis. And uh, among these, we have to, we should consider Kangler that we uh, saw it before, crushed P2Y12 inhibitors or uh, GPE's uh, um, IV. As I said before, and as 2018 and 2020 ESC guidelines suggest in this subset of patients uh, who were naive for P2Y12 receptor antagonist, the Kangler is the uh, um, drugs of choice uh, with a very, very low time of onset and time of offset with the, the metabolism, which is not dependent on renal or hepatic function. So, um, or even in patient uh, coming out a few hours before from you are uh, from a, a operating room can be used very safely uh, so we go on with the pci uh, we perform uh, the stent uh, distal uh, left main and then another very long stent was placed from mid to proximal uh, um, lad uh, we stent uh, then the um, optus marginal branch and then a second stent was placed from LED to uh, left main uh, here we can see on the right the final uh, pot um, the, uh, we have a suboptimal result on the osteal circumflex branch uh, so uh, we decide to go for a decay crush and uh, here is the final result so a very good final result uh, team flow of uh, this slide I showed you already before, but it's important to understand that uh, we have to switch uh, uh, Kangler to oral P2Y12 inhibitor, and uh, we can choose uh, any of the um, P2Y12 inhibitor we have on the market, uh, clopidogrel, prasugrel, or ticagrel. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, prasugrel and clopidogrel should be uh, administered immediately after this discontinuation of Kangler, while Ticagler should be started um, ideally um, at the start of Kangler infusion. This is the predischarge echo showing uh, um, mild mitral regurgitation and mild uh, mitral uh, aortic regurgitation, sorry. Uh, so concluding, which reverse of surgery is the best and for whom? This is a, should be weighted in uh, all patients, despite what guidelines uh, told us and the scores told us. Um, uh, in acute phase, uh, uh, the urgent coronary angiography is, crush, is crucial to uh, preserve myocardial at risk. Kangler may represent an attractive option uh, in uh, um, patients uh, who are naive for P2Y12 uh, uh, undergoing PCI in acute coronary syndrome setting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And I think because of the time, we're going to move to our last speaker, Dr. Abdullah Shahab. He will talk to us about the management of serum potassium in patients with heart failure. Dr. Abdullah. 
you very much and uh, great to see you all. This is going to be very brief. Um, one of the major problems we face nowadays is uh, management of heart failure and how to optimize their medication. And uh, either ourselves or our colleague in uh, kidneys, they stop the RACs, MRA, and uh, then we have problem with the patient's readmission and mortality. Uh, so I'll just take you through this case uh, for our audience and uh, attendees so we can solve this case together and then we'll see the role of new uh, potassium binder. This is a 67-year-old diabetic patient who's supposed to be on a right medication for diabetes, is on uh, metformin and uh, also uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So patient coming to us with the symptoms and signs of heart failure and um, biomarkers and the echo suggest of the HEFREF. So the coronary angiography of this patient is non ischemic uh, heart failure. So seeing patient like this, and uh, we know from the latest guidelines, there are you know four uh, stones, or you can say uh, major uh, medications for the heart failure, morbidity, mortality. So what's going to be our uh, management for this patient? Just uh, for five seconds, which one are you going to start, A or B? You're going to start on beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, plus the SGLT already on, or you're going to add all the three, so we have four together. I'm sure uh, we all go for the B, but A is still a possibility. The problem with this, because when you put all the RACs and MRA together, then you have a problem of maybe uh, renal function get worse and you have potassium um, get worse. And we know from the studies that the RACs, um, starting from ACE inhibitor, uh, AR, and uh, uh, you can see the uh, uh, ARNI, all of them are improving the, uh, the, the morbidity and mortality, and um, even now with the ARNI and the HEFPEF. And the, with the new guidelines, I think recently you've seen this just a, a month ago, that we start with four together, ACE inhibitors, beta blocker, MRA, SGLT2, then based on patient's uh, tolerability, affordability, then we can increase this medication and to reach their uh, uh, studied uh, doses. The problem with that uh, we'll see now, uh, uh, the patients, if we're gonna do that, how soon we're gonna, are we gonna check their potassium? How many of us are gonna do that? Are we doing it in our practice? I think we should do that. And then when to be that? Uh, as per the guidelines, uh, is it uh, one to two weeks or six months or uh, don't know. So the guidelines basically tell us, you know, we need to do that within weeks. And that could be one to two weeks for uh, ACE inhibitor ARBs or MRA uh, up to four weeks. So this patient already established nicely in this medication for two, three months and already on a optimal uh, four medications. No any more symptoms of heart failure. We call it now we don't call it stable, we call it say remission heart failure, now new, new uh, names. So patients, if you look at their signs, symptoms, um, all the uh, biomarkers and the echo even improved remarkably and the uh, NT of MB. The problem here, as you can see, potassium is increased. It was 4.9, now it's 5.8. So the question is, if you see that, is this, would you, cons cons are you concerned about this? Yes or no? I'm sure you should be concerned because this is called moderate hyperkalemia. So, uh, and we know it's either physiological because this patient already got chronic kidney disease, got heart failure, got diabetes, and the age. There are four reasons for this patient to high, 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 hyperkalemia. And of course, the medication we have here, MRA and ACE inhibitors and uh, ARNI, uh, so cause that, of course, and we don't know about the diet of this patient. So we need to be careful because this hyperkalemia, if it's acute, is a problem because you know we all know this from the cardiac toxicity and to the even death could happen. But uh, uh, so we again, if if we, we need to know uh, when we treat heart failure, we either get hypokalemia or hyperkalemia. But hyperkalemia is more common, and especially when there is a chronic kidney disease, especially like this patients. So a patient could be asymptomatic, and patient sometimes you see the ECG changes. And uh, sometimes it's very late to, to, to not say anything. So it's really, it's, it's the area. So 3.5 up to five, then you start to have uh, uh, mild and moderate and, and, and severe hyperkalemia. So these are the biggest study looking at that. And majority of these patients who have uh, hyperkalemia, those who are diabetic, heart failure and kidney disease, exactly similar to our patient here. 
So hyperkalemia is a prevalent in chronic uh, conditions. You know, we have in our region here, um, uh, if we looked, I don't, I'm sure all of you have seen the Gulf Care, uh, which is a hyper a heart failure patient coming to ER, 5,000 patients, 60% of them, they've had hypertension. So having hypertension, that means you have hyperkalemia. Patient had diabetes, patient had, um, uh, in addition to the heart failure, uh, you know, uh, 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 has chronic kidney diseases. So these are all the, 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 the reason for patients to have hyperkalemia. Not only that, these patients, if you see them on, on, on a, on a follow-up, you see them, you know, they, they're at risk of getting hyperkalemia. Uh, first visit, second, the third visit. Unless, we, unless you look for it, you will not find it. So RASI therapy is associated with increased risk of hyperkalemia, which frequently leads to down titration. That we do. What we do normally when we see somebody like that, we... Um, we, we, we stop it sometimes, or we down titrate. And, and, and doing that, and, and, and that's seen in all the studies, if you look or randomized clinical trial, when there is a placebo on treatment, there is a, re, a high increase of the, of, the, of the potassium, similarly with the uh, army. So although the people say maybe army is not, but it is. And elevated potassium associated with double uh, dose reduction and discontinuation. This is what we do. We either we, we stop it or do, uh, dose re reduce. This is our practice, uh, which is wrong. And doing that, when we do that, pair of studies showed this. We do that, you are double or triple increase the morbidity and mortality of the patients. So uh, it's, not an, it's, not a, it's not a practical and it's not good for our patients. And that results in maybe in patients stay more in hospital and cost and uh, so on. So indirect effect of hyperkalemia, I've already mentioned that, is just re re result in uh, down reduction, uh, dose reduction or uh, discontinuation. And uh, obviously, if we do that, I think some of you are uh, running some hospitals, so you know that's uh, cost on the, on, the, on the administration because cost of uh, hospitalization, $11,000, maybe $1,000, uh, $11, yes, compared to a cost of this medication is less than $1,000. So it's a dilemma, isn't it? to prescribe RASI and accept the presence of hyperkalemia or to discontinue, discontinue RASI and lose the benefit of clinical outcomes. Uh, or we find an alternative to that. So until now, we've been doing, uh, going to acutely treat these patients uh, with a very old uh, fashion. I will not go through it. I think you all know it. Uh, these are the things we do, dietary reduction. Uh, I mean, there are lots of disadvantage to that uh, or down titration, we've really seen that or administer loop diuretics. And that's maybe an acute effect, but on long term, uh, you, you will still, you'll not get that uh, reduced. You, you will get the opposite. Or administers the old uh, potassium binder, which some of them uh, are got a, a, uh, some warning from uh, FDA. Or we go with the new uh, uh, potassium binder, which is the one available now in, the, in, in our region is uh, Petromer, and this one not available. So I'm, so I'm gonna discuss this one. It's ins uh, insoluble, non-absorbable spheric polymer exchange potassium. So basically, swallow it uh, to the GI tract, and this will not be go to the doesn't go to the blood exchange for the uh, for the potassium. So get rid, rid of the potassium for the calcium. Uh, the only problem with this is, is constipation, uh, as per all the studies. And but you see the race enhancement on all the studies up to ninety one percent. So you're able to continue with RASIs up to 91 percentage, which the efficacy is great. The only side effects is the constipation and hypomagnesemia. So this patient, what are the evidence-based treatment option for hyperkalemia management in this patient? Now you've seen the 5.8 is the potassium. So will you do this? We really seen the disadvantage of that. Implement potassium diet restriction. We've seen how, um, yeah, limitation of that. Loop diuretics, we've seen also that. Intermittent use of traditional, no use. So I'm sure you will go with the uh, next generation uh, potassium binder. If you not use it, then uh, once you use it, you will know how, how nice it is. So nearly half of the patient in the, in the, in the paternal clinical program had half heart failure. So it's been tested in heart failure, tested in chronic kidney disease and hypertension and showed the safety and efficacy uh, so far. And, and, that, and you can see how significantly keep the potassium uh, uh, low and reduction compared to the placebo uh, on these studies. Um, and, and this is the safety which we know. So this is the study which we are looking for and waiting. We know uh, if we continue with the RASI, we continue MRA, uh, the, the outcome, we've seen it. We, we don't need to, uh, anybody to tell us. That. But to, something to help us to do that, we think it will improve the outcome. But we don't know until we see the study which is coming in two, 
2022. So following a, a resol a resolution of hyperkalemia, what are the next steps? What are you going to do? I've titrated RASI now to maximal tolerated dose and continue with the use of this patromer, or you up titrate RASI and discontinue use of next generation monomer, or continue frequent monitoring of this. I'm sure yani, here is A appropriate and C is appropriate. So what the guidelines say, just two last uh, slides. Uh, this is the 2021. So both components, uh, the one we have Petromer and or SZC are effective in normalizing uh, the elevated potassium level, maintaining hyper, uh, hypo, uh, normal kalemia over time and preventing the recurrence of hyperkalemia and can be considered for treatment of hyperkalemia. So this is administered um, in the sachet and uh, by water. Uh, and uh, and uh, so we have th three scenarios. Normal kalemia with a RASI, you initiate RASI, you titrate it up to the maximum. When there's between five and 6.5, you initiate this medication, uh, then you maintain uh, the, the level uh, as it is, then you continue your, with, with the RASI. But if it's more than 6.5, 6, uh, 6 of course, we are not in that case, here you, you, you possibly discontinue, of course, RASI here, and initiate the, this medication and the close monitor of the patient. So I hope, you know, with, with this, having this kind of medication available with us, we're able to better control and, and manage our heart failure patients, uh, which is very prevalent, and it's about 7 million in the, in the world. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll go back to Dr. Musa. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Abdullah Shab, and thank for all our speakers and uh, my co-moderators. So if I uh, ask Dr. Matthew Kusengi and Luca Tista will be with us. Uh, we have uh, uh, questions in the QA box. If kindly uh, be with us to ask them. Uh, the first question, uh, so we'll go over um, some of the question. Uh, the first question uh, is most, uh, this is probably for, um, for, uh, for Dr. Matthew or Dr. Tista can also um, um, can answer this question. Most of the patient who had high bleeding risk, they have also a high ischemic risk. So what is the advice for equal bleeding and ischemic risk? Uh, to use uh, longer duration or optimal duration or shorter duration if the both ischemic risk and bleeding risk are uh, approximately equal or uh, they are not um, not showing one over the others well uh, that obviously th this is a complicated question so I'll try to be as clear as possible so uh, there's no single score to evaluate the risk of bleeding as well as the risk of ischemic events. So in other words, uh, the two numbers are, you know, can be similar only because of play of chance. Just an example. If we use the as bled or we use the IRC ischemic risk, well, they give different numbers. So if they can be four, well, the same four, the same five, but they are completely different. So from this perspective, at least the European guidelines, they say that for the first one, the first week after the procedure in a patient with indication to oral anticoagulation because of atrial fibrillation, in the first week, there's no, no discussion. Just go ahead with a triple therapy. After that, only if the risk of ischemic events is well, very high, very, very high. Okay, you keep going for a month with a triple antiparatide therapy. Otherwise, just go with a dual therapy. And that's it. That's the only reasonable thing that we can do. But how can we define highest risk of ischemic events? Well, I don't know, maybe very long uh, um, stenting, a CTO, um, two stent technique to the left main, something like that. So in other words, there are specific, specific situation where the ischemic risk can uh, balance a very high hemorrhagic risk. But again, that's really very practical approach. Yeah. There's another question, uh, Dr. Uh, Teste, that uh, in, in this aspect, you know, we have uh, used some of uh, your colleague, I think, or you showed the uh, different kind of uh, of uh, bleeding scores so yeah. uh, so we have so many bleeding scores. now the question 
comes here, which one you will you recommend most uh, as a bleeding? Well, uh, and this is another another good question. I mean, of course, there are a lot of a lot of of different uh, you know different bleeding risks, but the one that, that is strongly suggested by the European guidelines is the as bled. And uh, well, I'm not here to say that the has bled is the best in class. No, it's not. However, it's probably the simplest because if you look at the details and if you look at the major manual criteria, the has bled is really, really simple. And after a few times that you do it, you do it by memory. So it's really fast tracking. But if you talk about you know the advantage of the has bled over the precise DAP over the all, all the other tools no well there's no comparison there's no comparison there is no one can tell but again guidelines suggest to use the asblet that's for simplicity i guess so i you, european uh, they uh, they endorse the asblet so i think asblet is more practically used there is a it is it ABC is core abc expensive you, you need the laboratory of the uh, testing. So this is the most easy, cheap, widely available uh, score, but not the best, but the most. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. It's the easiest for sure. Yeah. It's the best. No, it's not the best. Yeah. There is another question said how uh, we interrupt DAPT when patient need a non-cardiac surgery and he is at the very highest chemic risk. Oh. Do we do a bridge with canigrelol if it's available? And if yes, okay, but if the canigrelol, canigrelol is not available, how we, we we tackle this problem with a very high ischemic risk? Well, well, first of all, let's let's distinguish between uh, a surgery that can be delayed and a surgery that is urgent, so it must be done. Well, in the in a setting of emergency, emergency surgery. No question, just go ahead with surgery because there's something that the surgeon has to do. So it's not on our shoulders, I would say. If the surgery can be postponed, let's say few days, well, that's exactly the question, I guess. Because in that case, if the bleeding risk or if the ischemic risk is very high, it de depends on the timing with respect to the PCI. I mean, if the PCI has been performed three months earlier, six months a year, it makes a lot of difference. The real question is what to do when the stent has been placed a week before. In that case, we have no data, no data at all. What I, what I sometimes do, if it's possible, of course, I actually ask the surgeon to give me time for a coronary angio and an OCT to check for the endothelialization, but this is far away from the from the evidence because there's nothing in the guidelines. Nothing. The only thing that we can do is to check whether the stent is well opposed, well expanded, and endothelialized. So in that case, we can re relatively safely take one antibloodlet therapy out. But of course, this is no evidence. Here's another question, and um, I please uh, also is open for my co-moderator and Dr. Abdel, if they have any questions to ask, they feel free, please. But I'm just um, um, uh, trying to demonstrate the questions in the QA box. Uh, there is another question. Can you suggest who need the, the left atrial abending, uh, abended, sorry, closure device? Oh, who yes. Yes, and well. Can you do it? Uh, Without, of course, bleeding is the one, but can you have any other indication to, for or when to use yeah. the actual closure? Let, uh, let me distinguish again. So uh, there are two, uh, let's say, two philosophies around LAEA closure. The, one, the first one is from North America, and the other one is from Europe. North America uh, suggests the LAEA closure instead of uh, lifelong anticoagulation. In Europe, this is not possible. LAA closure is indicated only for those patients who has experienced a major bleeding. Yes. So the, the situation is clear. I mean, yes. unless your patient has had already a major bleeding, no way, 
In Italy, there, in Italy, as well as in Europe, there's no indication. You can't close the LAAA. In US, it's totally different because the patient, well, the physician has the choice between drug or device. Yeah. There's another question, I think. <clears throat> They said, uh, in, you know, in, in double therapy, triple AFib with PCI, in part of the uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, do you use or have you used, and in which condition, ticagrelol or presogrel as part of your therapy and an AFib with PCI? Yeah, it happened to me several times because, as you know, for example, in particular for acute coronary syndromes, it may happen that the patient, it comes in, it comes in, you do the procedure and then you select prasugrel or ticagrelor and in the few following days, it has atrial fibrillation. So you don't know, you didn't know before. So you didn't think about using clopidogrel. So in that case, you need to switch back. You actually decide uh, the timing, but clearly if there is indication to an oral, oral anticoagulation, you need to switch to clopidogrel. You need to do that. Otherwise, even for a week, the bleeding risk will be too high. But in, in situation, you know, the data are more with the clobidogrel, 90% in all five trials, they have used clobidogrel. It's only a small uh, percentage they have used uh, tigagrelol and much lower percentage prosugrel. So very limited data, but however, if you use tigagrelol, in case if you cannot use a clobidogrel, then you, then then the, you go with five days or one week and then double therapy. Yeah, but, I agree. I agree. But, I mean, of course, but the, no... but the ninety percent sorry experience are a clobidogrel for all the trials showing the safety. So we go with a default uh, plan to use a clobidogrel as part of the P two Y two antagonist. Yeah, well, I totally agree. I mean, there is a, this is a, an example of. I mean, the difference between the practice and the data. We don't have enough data to support the idea of using ticagrelor. For example, even the low dose of ticagrelor, you know, the one that we've used for long-term management. I mean, we don't have this data. So I think it's reasonable to stick to clopidogrel and to reevaluate the patient in the, the follow-up, of course. We have uh, two, three more questions and then we'll close. Um... One of the question here is uh, in, in terms, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kasingi, Matthew Kasingi has presented this case in patient with acute coronary syndrome. Will you approach graft intervention as this is acute closure of a graft or you leave it and deal with the native artery? He's not with us, but if- No, you... yeah, I'm thinking he's has left, but I can yeah. tell you that our yeah. approach is usually uh, straightforward. I mean unless the coronary the native coronaries are terribly diseased or, I mean, not really approachable from a technical point of view, we used to treat the coronary arteries and leave the graft alone. But of course, this is a general sentence because there are situations where you put just one single stent, spot stent, direct stent to the graft and it's fine. Other cases, where you need to do a retrograde CTO for a coronary artery. So, of course, it depends. But again, the general concept is we treat the coronary arteries unless this treatment is far more complicated than treating the, the, the graft. We have one question from Bahrain, from our dear colleague, Dr. Habib Tarif. He's asking if you choose clobidogrel and dual antiplatelet therapy for high-risk PCI, do you need to study the platelet response to detect the non-responder? No, no, we don't do that. We don't do that routinely, at least. And this is because there are some data showing that even a genetically based approach where patients have been randomized to an increased dose of clopidogrel according to the dual antiplatelet, the antiplatelet residual function has failed. There is no advantage. So we don't do that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we'd like to thank Mustafa Shimmeri is giving all most of the questions in the QA. So he's addressing one more question to Dr. Professor Shab. He said, you have presented the excellent summary of heart failure. Is the uh, potassium binder is a cost-effective treatment, uh, Dr. Abdullah Shab? 
That's the only question addressed to you, Abdullah. Is it a cost effective? You are muted, uh, Dr. Abdullah. I am not muted, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the voice is back and forth. No, Dr. Shema, thank you very much. Habibna, and he's, he's mashallah very active. You know, I, I showed you the data. I mean, this is from economy uh, economics, and they put everything together, and they showed you how much money you can save over a year. And uh, compared to the, I mean, we have Dr. Al Majid here. Is a CMO of, and he, he knows how much the, the the hospitalization and the patient being in hospital cost. If you can avoid that from hospitalization and mortality, of course, the, the soul of person is very important to us. It costs seven hundred dollars compared to hospitalization eleven thousand dollars. So that's the difference I'm saying. Uh, I think I will ask last question. This is from my side, uh, Doctor uh, or Professor Teste. Uh, yeah. When couple question and then I will close. Do you use a twilight approach for low risk bleeder? That is the three months going on aspirin, uh, uh, tigagrelol, and then monotherapy. Do you, although, although reminding you in the low risk, the, the guidelines has class it as class one indication. Would you use that approach? Not really. Not, not really, not really, not really. I mean, then, <laughs> look, the question, well, I mean, that's, you know, th this question is really appropriate. I mean, uh, sometimes- That's my question. Sorry to ask you this, it's not political, but I want to know because it is classified in the guidelines as a class one, but uh, nobody's using this approach in the low risk profile. Well, I can tell you, and well, actually I can guarantee that if you ask this question to 100 colleagues, 90, 95% will tell exactly the same thing. I do not feel safe. To do that and this is actually my answer You're this right. is why i don't do that i mean okay. of course low risk clearly low risk is the patient that you evaluate for the shortest do anti blood therapy you, the, of course i agree nevertheless unless the patient has a significant bleeding risk what is the point of reducing as much as the twilight said they do anti-blood red therapy. I honestly do not see the point. Now, one last question, unless my colleagues, co-moderator will ask, uh, do you use a duox in patient with renal dialysis, chronic renal dash dialysis? No. So no. you use vitamin K antagonist? Yeah, I'm sorry to say that, but I mean, our guidelines are very strict. To, so in this perspective, for all patients, all patients where uh, GFR, a glomerular filtration rate less than 30, less than, there's contraindication to use novel uh, antiguagula therapy. No way. That's contraindicated. Uh, um, even though the, the American, the renal study or um, on the no. abexibam is it's not. contraindicated. It's contraindicated. Yeah, and then there is, a, by the way, abexibam and low dose, this is a German study is ongoing with this, but we will Look, wait. But, but yeah, the, yeah, but, those, um, American I, didn't show any beneficial um, effect over the war for it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can tell you that we have a specific prescription platform for this new drug, well, relatively new drugs. And if the patient has GFR less than 30, it, it's not prescribable, okay. not, a, not at all. So there's no discussion. I mean, our guidelines are very clear that perspective sure so before i conclude i will just uh, uh, ask doctor my co-moderator doctor mohammed bilghaith from saudi arabia if you want to say the last uh, one minute any comment about the symposium any uh, any comment any question any any things doctor mohammed fadal i think they did a great job they tried to cover most of the uh, bleeding problems related to coronary artery disease to structural heart including TAVI, uh, valve and valve, and even the repair, percutaneous repair. And I would like to thank both the speaker, the one who left, Matthew and Dr. Uh, Luca, uh, for their uh, excellent presentation and overview, and to thank my colleague, Abdullah, for his potassium uh, management. Sure. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Abdul Majid Zubaydi, uh, our colleague from Dubai, would you add uh, the last statement before we close, Dr. Abdul Majid? Uh, I enjoyed the, you know, the uh, 
all the talks and the cases, uh, I think, you know, it gave us a, a very high level and a focused uh, review on the, you know, on the antiplatelets and also managing uh, the lipids, the guideline uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, you know, the questions uh, also have been uh, very focused and, uh, you know, informative. Uh, thanks, and uh, I think we're over the time, so. Yeah, Dr. Abdullah Shab, as a vice president of Gulf Intervention Society, uh, you want to do any comments and say any comments about the the last symposium series in our series? This is number six. Yeah, Before thank you very much. Physical. Thank you very much, the speakers and the moderators. Please, as Dr. Musa said at the beginning, GIS, uh, one month uh, to go, <laughs> inshallah. Okay. We'd like to see you all there. It's going to be a different. Uh, uh, I'll leave yeah. the secret for, uh, for when you see it, inshallah. <laughs> So we, will, we will release the agenda in two days, about within two days, and we are happy to see it's, a, it's a, an invitation for all those 125 participants who uh, are participated with us in this symposium. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Luca Testa, thank you very much, you and your group from Milan, Italy, for joining us for very informative uh, uh, rich really lectures on uh, acute coronary syndrome, antiplatelets, anticoagulants, the very hot topic, triple therapy, and also the very well rich uh, anticoagulant, antiplatelet in the structural heart disease, TAVI and mitral clip, and finally the lower lipid uh, drugs and the overview of that. Thank you very much. We hope that we see you in our Gulf Interventional Society meeting in November. And I would like to thank my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Abdul Majid Zubaydi, President of Emirates uh, Cardiac Society, Dr. Mohamed Bulghaith, uh, Professor of Interventional Ca uh, Cardiologist and ACC Governor, uh, and all of you, Abdullah Shab, for joining us. And also, I would like to thank the most active um, uh, guy who gave the nine questions in the QA, Dr. Mustafa Shemiri. Thanks for your informative questions valuable and thank for all 125 participants and thank you for everybody and sponsoring of this uh, event and ICOM for organizing and we hope to see you in about a month from now in the uh, United Arab Emirates in the Dubai in uh, Intercontinental Visible City for our big meeting which is the Gulf Intervention Society meeting. Thank you very much and have a nice night and goodbye for everybody. Goodbye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.